Welcome everyone to my talk on protecting web-based signal sign-on protocols against relying party impersonation attacks through um, dedicated bidirectional authenticated channel. Um, as David just said, it's the paper um, with probably the longest title. I think one reviewer put it as um, the abstract is already the title. Um, this is joint work with Yin Ka from Northwestern. He's now postdoc at Columbia. Jan from UC Santa Barbara, and of course our advisors Chris, Giovanni, and um, another Jan. Um, Yin can't be here because of visa issues, and Jan can't be here for scheduling issues, so I have to fill in. Um, anyways, let me first start by giving you an impression of what I'm going to be talking about for the next 25 minutes. Um, first, although I'm pretty sure most of you are aware of what single sign-on is. I'm going to recap a little bit on how it works in detail. I'm going to do this on an OAuth 2 um, protocol while it similarly also works in OpenID. Um, then I will explain what our threat model is, what the different concepts are, which you need to know. Um, the paper, of course, goes into more detail there. Um, then I will come to the gist of our paper, how we are actually like, remedying the issues current protocols have and how we're securing it, uh, um, existing SSL protocols. Following this, I will um, discuss the evaluation both from a security standpoint as well as from um, a performance standpoint because it's a web-based thing, so you probably don't want to wait three seconds till the authentication happens. Um, so first off, single sign-on is essentially just the idea to log into a website with an account at a different website. For instance, you have an account with Facebook or Google and you want to use it to log in into Stack Overflow, and this is exactly the example which we're going over. Um, so essentially the login form just looks like this, and you're giving the option to log in with Google, Facebook, Stack Exchange, then we have think, uh, Yahoo, WordPress, Blogger, and a few others. And if we just go on with like logging in with Google, we're getting the Google prompt for like filling out the password, logging in. If this is the first time we're using Stack Overflow, at that point we're going to be seeing like um, this side, uh, this part that Stack Exchange wants to get authorization to access my email address and some basic information which they're then using to essentially create an account on their website which I then can use to log in with my Google account. And then if I grant this authorization, I'm essentially going to get a, Google, um, a Stack, Over, Stack Exchange account which you can log in with my Google account. And of course, there's some magic behind this, um, which is happening in the background, meaning there's some tokens being passed from Google to Stack Overflow and back. And if we look into detail, into just the first interaction between uh, Stack Overflow, in this case, this is the resource server there. And then we have the authorization server or the identity provider. I'm going to be using identity provider for the rest of this talk, which is Google in this case is there. And if you just look at the RFC for OAuth 2, for instance, it's right now 152 pages. So if you want to implement this properly, at some point you're probably going to miss a little thing there, which might end up into the point where you might be able to impersonate either party or where you might be able to impersonate the user, the relying party, or the IDP. Um, of course, the question is, if this goes wrong, what can possibly go wrong? And if we take a look at SSL vulnerabilities, essentially they just mean that you're either impersonating the user at an IDP level. For instance, if you're granting the New York Times the possibility to post to your Facebook wall that you liked one article, um, this essentially allows if a malicious um, website would get your token, which you should be, which Google or Facebook should be sending to the, um, the New York Times. Um, they would be able to post on your wall on your behalf, meaning essentially everything they're doing is going to show up on your wall with your name. Or in the other case, it might just end up in being data or privacy leaks. For instance, if you're granting Stack Exchange or Stack, Open, uh, Stack Overflow, the possibility to fetch data from Google information like all your friends or all the phone numbers for your contact, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the question is, this is actually an issue, are SSO protocols, which are currently there, actually vulnerable? And there has been two studies, one at Oakland um, 12 and one at CCS 12, and they actually found a bunch of vulnerabilities. For instance, one at all identified five vulnerabilities which allowed either to impersonate the identity provider, in this case, I think it was Facebook, um, on, I think, Farmville, then there's like, or to identify the, uh, imp uh, impersonate the relying party, the New York Times, for instance, and to post on the user's behalf, or to impersonate the user and get data 
from the identity provider. And then there's also that um, Sun et al. there um, evaluated a bunch of uh, websites which use single sign-on, and they found out that 6.5% um, of, all of all of them are vulnerable to impersonation attacks where you can impersonate the website which is infected. And if we go on, for instance, it's quite noticeable that SSO protocols are brittle. If you look, for instance, at the Facebook app plugin security page, which tells you how you should secure your app, it's essentially a list of bullet points which goes on for four different pages just to tell you, like, yeah, you need to secure this, you need to disable this, you need to do this. And this is, we and also prior work, just, we think it's not really a viable solution that you give a random developer like, a list of four pages of bullet points which he needs to address to, for security reasons. And yeah, as prior work also has shown, it's going to end up in vulnerabilities. Um, so, but let me up, back up a little bit on the threat model. In this case, um, the concepts which are important to know in our case. And so you essentially have three different entities which are involved in any SSL protocol. There's the identity provider, a set Facebook, Google, OpenID. Um, it's just the centralized identification service. In our case, we're assuming it's trusted and benign, meaning the IDP is not going to send out fake credentials but that the relying party could rely on what the IDP is sending. Then we have the relying party, which is a website which wants to use the IDP to authenticate users, and in our case, which can be malicious as to whatever degree it wants. It can fake packages. It can try to authenticate users who didn't really try to authenticate to them. Um, and then we have the user who wants to use the RP servers and who is trusted and benign. And if we look into attacks which are possible in this case, given existing protocols, there's A, which is in scope. Um, there's a benign relying party and benign websites initiates the request, but at some point on the wire, package is being changed, and a malicious um, relying party receives the response and stats, for instance, through um, intercepting communication. And if we take, for example, the current way how OAuth protocols works, um, which is just a redirection chain, we're telling you, where you as the relying party are telling the IDP, what website you should redirect the token to, which is essentially just an HTTP request to the IDP with some parameters, which is the app ID, which is the identifier for the relying party. Then you have the redirection URL which and the next URL, which tell you where the token should be given to. And the first attack essentially is just modification of those two parameters at some, somewhere on the way between the RP to the IDP. And then there's a second attack, which is in scope, which is a malicious RP starts to initiate the request, and in that case, essentially, you're just faking the app ID of a legitimate um, app. And in both cases, this asset results in information leakage or user impersonation attacks. Um, however, of course, given that we can't really protect against everything, there are some attacks which are out of scope. Um, in our case, this is social engineering, meaning your credentials are being fished and then being misused. Then there's a compromised or vulnerable relying party which means essentially at that point you could grab the tokens from the relying party already. Then there's a malicious user brother, for instance, there has been a case where um, the relying party did not verify that the email address sent from the IDP was actually signed. It was signed, but the signature was just ignored, which of course allows the user to simply replace the identifier with whatever identifier they want it to be and impersonate other users. Then there are implementation issues, for instance, yeah, missing verification checks, and then there's privacy leaks. Privacy leaks in this sense are, for instance, if the refer, if you're including a web, uh, an advertisement on your website and you're using this for um, a single sign-on authentication, depending on how the author uh, authorization token is giving to you, you might actually leak the token in the referrer to the advertiser. And given those, of course, just quickly look at how current protocols are brittle in the sense that they're like, what the reasons are, what are they using to verify the different identities, and um, how you can authenticate that one party is actually the party they're, they're telling you. Um, in current protocols, you have mostly the IDP, which is identified as the with a web origin, meaning yeah, you're the scheme, the host, and the port, which in the sense is secure given that uh, you're enforcing web origin tracking in the browser, that you're using HTML5, and for instance, if you're using the sandbox tag. Um, then in addition, most of the time, you have the relying party which uses a unique identifier. Depending on the protocol, this might just be a number, it might be a unique name. And for Facebook, it's app ID. For Yarn Rain, it's the app name and settings handle. 
And in most cases, you have the user which is also giving some identifier, which doesn't really matter in this case. Um, and the main issue here is that the RP identifier can easily be forged, meaning you can just come up with whatever identifier you want, and the IDP needs to possibly verify that you're actually the um, RP you're essentially telling them that you are. And of course, this is essentially the problem of the identifier, uh, that the authenticity of message is not necessarily given. And this check that it's actually the RP which you're talking to is often forget. And next up, there's also the communication possibly between the RP and the IDP, which might be um, spoofed or like, um, might be sniffed on. So if the token is being passed in clear text, you can possibly get the token. And depending on the verification checks on both sides, you might be able to possibly use this token to impersonate a user. Um, in current protocols, the, um, the communication mostly works through the HTTP redirect chains, which I had a little bit before, meaning the RP tells the IDP where to send the token back. But nobody can really be, like, the IDP cannot really be certain that the response is actually going to the relying party it should be. It has to do some whitelisting checks. And so you're essentially forcing the app developer to whitelist all the domains where it should go to, which of course in the past has been resulted in a lot of vulnerabilities because they were too broad or because they didn't work in the beginning. So the, the app developer just says, like, yeah, whatever, I'm just going to use wildcard.com or something, which yeah, it doesn't really help in the performance security standpoint. Alternatively, there's some other protocols which use an in-browser communication channel for instance, using post message in HTML5, or if you're using Flash objects, some of them have compatibility issues with all the browsers, which um, is why Facebook started to opt for Flash, which then resulted in fa the Facebook um, SSL being vulnerable because the malicious party, were a uh, relying party, was able to spoof a request, and then what, although the request was going to the, uh, the benign relying party because of how it communicates, it, was able to sniff this message and then impersonate users. And because of those reasons, because there's essentially so many little things which you as a developer need to take care of, we're thinking that we should just come up with a secure, dedicated, bi-directional, authenticated and secure, uh, channel which we can use wh where you can build the protocol on top of. Um, and to have an, uh, an identity which you cannot easily forge given that, yeah, the App ID is one of the main reasons why current vulnerabilities fail. We started to, we um, opted to use the, um, for the re, uh, relying party, also the web origin as the identity because if you're at the IDP, you can easily verify it. There's some details which are special which you need to take care of. They're discussed in the paper because I can't go over them due to time reason. Um, and if you look at our protocol in detail, it's mostly inspired by TLS, uh, TLS and SSL. Uh, but it's slightly more simple because you don't really need all the cipher handshake um, in for a short protocol like this. Um, and if we look at the channel, using it in detail is, is very simple. In the first case, you essentially just like to establish the channel, you're just trading, having a simple handshake of where you're sending back a public, where the RP is sending a public key to the IDP, which can be generated for each interaction. Um, then you're verifying the identity based on the web origin so that the IDP is talking to the correct relying party. Then it's sending back a generated session key and a channel number. The channel numbers are later being used so that you can retrieve the session key. Um, then the, uh, using the session key, the relying party is sending back um, a key, uh, the channel number as well, which the IDP can then decrypt. And after that, you can essentially just use the channel at that point, it's encrypted. You have verified the identity of both parties. And you can be certain that you're actually talking to the RP you should be talking to. And if we look into more detail into how sending messages works, it's quite simple. It's essentially just going through, yeah, you have the message. You have to split it into chunks, given that the encryption is symmetric, given you have to use the block, uh, you have to have the messages being split in chunks which have the correct block size, you can easily just imagine using CBC here if you would want to. And then at the end, you're just sending out the channel number and the, uh, for both the IDP and the RP. Um, in this case, they don't have to be encrypted anymore because even if the attacker modifies them on the wire, it doesn't really matter because at that point, if you try to decrypt the message in the next step, you would just be using a different key which would not decrypt it properly. 
And at that point, you don't really care anymore. Um, and there's also a control board which you can just use to close the connection given a simple TCP fin handshake style. Um, there we go. And given that, um, you, it's really, really hard to just come and swoop, swipe, swoop in with a new protocol because simply, yeah, nobody's going to adopt it as quickly as, yeah. There are a lot of infrastructure for SSO protocols which are not going to be replaced from one day to the other. So instead, we just decided to, okay, there should be some kind of transition step which allows us to um, gradually replace infrastructure or at least try to protect the users of some kind of RP and IDP um, against attacks. And this is why we came up with a, some, with a way to deploy the new protocol, um, with the new channel um, and SSO protocols based on them on a, as a proxy. In this case, um, you do not need to replace the existing infrastructure which you have. For instance, you can use the insecure Facebook authentication or the insecure Google authentication. And um, essentially, the only thing that happens is the proxy communicates with the legacy IDP and it acts as an RP and it communicates with the RP and acts as, a, as a, an IDP for it, as a new secure IDP. And there, of course, there's some things which, you need, of course, the first step is that um, you have to be t very careful when you set up the proxy. The proxy has to be set up in a secure environment because otherwise you're subject to exactly the same vulnerabilities as before. So you should not be able to set it up while you're doing whatever you usually do, but you should set it up in a more clean environment. There's some um, nuances which you have to take care of. For instance, if you're proxying an OAuth-like protocol, you essentially have to you get all the, uh, the permissions which the RPs also want, and then you have to do some filtering on the side. But if you're, for instance, using an OpenID-like protocol, you can just get the proof of authentic authentication from the IDP, from the legacy IDP, and simply forward it to the RP, and at that point, you're good. You have securely authenticated the user at the RP and the RP can talk directly to the legacy IDP and retrieve the data. Um, we implemented both of those um, for prototype just to see, just to verify that everything works in detail. Um, we implemented both an OpenID-like and an OAuth-like protocol on top of it. Um, I don't have time to go into this into detail here, but the, all of the details are in the paper. Um, we ended up being roughly 750-ish lines of code in total. Um, and of course, we're relying on two libraries for cryptic crypto um, operations because there's no point in rolling your own crypto given it's going to fail at one point. Um, and of course, yeah, there's the proxy deployment which we implemented um, as a Facebook application. Given this, of course, we started to evaluate if the protocol is actually secure. We did this with, we formally verified it with Proverif, which was already mentioned in the second talk in the first session. Um, it's the automatic crypto protocol verifier based on the dollar Yao model. Um, it was introduced by Blanchett et al. And we used it to verify three different protocols, uh, three different parts of our protocol, which is A, that the channel is secure, that you cannot easily read the messages, the spoof messages, forge messages, um, that you cannot man in the middle. Um, and then there's the verification that the protocol uh, of the protocol that you can't really um, modify the protocol or interact with the protocol in a way that you are receiving information which you should not. And lastly, there's the verification of the proxy which of course in, this, in one step fails because the channel between the proxy and the legacy IDP is insecure. So you have, really have to take care that this step is being done in a secure environment. Given the channel verification, we also, just as a sanity check, removed um, the origin check at one point. So to see if Proverb actually is able to generate an attack scenario, and it did it generate an attack scenario where you can, where you can man in the middle the, connect, the connection between, from the RP to the IDP. Given this, there's also the point, like, we had prior work which actually identified five different vulnerabilities. Um, to what degree can our new channel, which you can build your SSL protocol on top of, um, actually mitigate those vulnerabilities. And if we look into more detail into them, there's the vulnerability between Facebook and the New York Times, which was the previously mentioned vulnerability in Flash, um, where a malicious RP talked to, be, uh, to Facebook as mimicking the New York Times, and then the token was being sent through Flash, and the malicious are to the benign RP, but the Flash um, 
the malicious RP was able to sniff it from the flash traffic. Um, in our case, this is, uh, is of course mitigated because the IDP can already verify at the identity of the RP, so it's not even going to talk back to the RP if it's not the correct RP. Um, then, in the next case, where you have Facebook and Zoho, there you could just set the service URL on the Zoho's website to your own malicious RP, although the, the authentication procedure failed. At Zoho's point, it still forwarded the authentication token to the malicious RP, which is kind of a huge thing. Um, then we have the Facebook legacy canvas auth, which is a vulnerability where not the RP got impersonated, but the IDP. In this case, um, Thumbwell was not verifying that it was actually talking to Facebook, but instead it was just taking whatever it was given and trusting it that it was talking to Facebook beforehand, which means, yeah, you can just make impersonate whoever you want. And this is in our case, it's also mitigated because you're not talking, the RP is always talking to the correct IDP because you have the web origin checking. And the next step, uh, you have Jan Rain wrapping Google, which is um, a vulnerability where um, a malicious RP was registering an account with Jan Rain and then changing the, serve, the next URL, the redirection URL, before the authentication reached Google, and at which point um, Google was sending it back to the malicious RP, but it was authenticating to the, uh, to the benign RP, which is also mitigated because of the web origin checking. And then in the last case, you have um, Jan Rain wrapping Facebook where Sears was using a too broad whitelist, which allowed um, an attacker to essentially inject JavaScript to a normal page and um, get sniff traffic, which was going for the SSL protocol. In our case, this is also, again, remedied because of the web origin and identity checking, and at the next point, because you have a secure channel. Of course, given that it's secure in that point, we also need to discuss if it actually is performant, if it's quick enough. And if we look at the different details, um, our prototype implementation, of course, is not by no means perfect. It's probably pretty slow from a JavaScript point of view. And um, you can probably easily optimize it a lot. Um, all of those times are re, um, were obtained through the JavaScript primitive for date, so they're not even like high accuracy. And they're the average of 10 runs, just running it 10 times. And if you look into more detail into just establishing the channel, which is clearly the longest one, um, it's in the first step, you have the generation of the public and the private key, which is taking most of the time. And then you have just sending a little bit, with, um, encrypting the, um, session key and the channel number, and then encrypting at the channel number from the RP, which are both not really, they're not really taking much time anyway. And if you want to actually speed this up by a lot, you can just easily start doing the, uh, starting the SSO, initially uh, establishing the channel while the user starts, uh, is it more or less searching for the login button or like navigating to the login button. You don't necessarily need to wait till he clicks on the login button. At that point, you can even reduce it even a little bit more. And if you look into more detail at, the, at exactly how the breakdown is, um, we see that the channel creation is actually taking the most, most of the time, which is on one and five, which is key generation. Um, and they're more or less 50% of the whole channel overhead. Um, and then you have two, four, six, and seven, which are dominated with the network latency, which in our case was 50 milliseconds, which is like at least in the US standard latency for in a, home internet, a residential home internet connection. And given those, um, we at least think that with 650 milliseconds is pretty okay for authentication, given the, secure, the security guarantees the protocol provides. And with this, I'm going to conclude. Um, I pointed out the root cause, why remote relying party uh, impersonation attacks uh, exist, which is essentially that if you have a non-dedicated, insecure one-way channel, where you don't really know which party you're talking to um, between the RP and the IDP. Then I proposed a dedicated bidirectional secure channel to remedy the existing issues, um, the shortcomings which you have. Um, based on this, you can design your own SSL protocol, um, which is, as said in the paper, an open ID-like protocol, which easily works, or you can use an OAuth-like protocol. Um, then I briefly talked about the proxy for, ease, uh, for easy adaptability, meaning so you can have a smooth transition from the existing protocols to, the, um, to a more secure protocol. 
Um, we also formally verified the security of, of the SSL protocol in our case, um, that, ever, that you cannot just start to impersonate whatever party and possibly impersonate a user or get data. And finally, I evaluated the performance overhead and the, talked a little bit about how much time it's going to take it, how you possibly could speed it up in case you want to deploy it in practice. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. So let me uh, ask a quick question while uh, people are having a think here. Um, interesting to see that uh, use of formal verification becoming some, somewhat routine in this kind of research. And I noticed that there was very little uh, detail in the paper about that. Um, is that because it was really straightforward or is it really complicated and you're going to write a whole bunch of papers about it? Well, it wasn't really that complicated. I mean, the steps which we had to take, they're like the modeling of the different parties. It's, it's a pretty simple protocol in the sense that it's just like, it's a one handshake in the beginning and then you're just encrypting a little bit. So for us, it was pretty straight. In this case, it was pretty straightforward. But did you use it as part of the, uh, part of the design process or was it basically your design was done when you started modeling? Our design was done when we started modeling. We essentially verified that everything was done and that we didn't like, make any stupid mistake on the way. Yeah. And you also mentioned that there was at least one uh, feature that you pulled out yes. of the system and checked that you really needed it. Yes, we removed the web origin checking for the RP, which is essentially the one thing which we introduced, um, which was necessary, which we think was necessary. And if we remove this, at that point, you can man in the middle of the protocol and you can remove you can impersonate the relying party as you please. Any other questions? Okay, that being the case, we'll uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you very much.